Once again, I'm going to talk about this meter by starting with Chuck Pinson's excellent book, Heathkit Test Equipment Products, which includes all regular models of Heathkit test equipment. I'm going to turn to the section on analog VOMs, multimeters, and voltmeters, so all their analog meters. Digital ones have a different chapter. So what we're really looking at here is a family of solid-state volt ohm meters that include the IM16, the IM25, which I already have a video on, and also part of the same family really, the IM17, which is a portable meter, very comparable to the IM16. And then that was re-released uh, later on as the IM5217. So four models, three basic designs. The IM25 was the top of the line in the series. The IM17 and 5217 were at the bottom end, and the IM16 was in the middle. The subject of this video is the IM16. Now note that they all came out at the same time. They were all introduced in 1967, and the two benchtop models, the IM16 and the IM25, were continued through to 1974. So not a real long run, but not super short either. Whereas the uh, simplest one in the series, the IM17, and its follow-up, the 5217, that also came out in 1967, remained as the IM-17 through 1977, and then reintroduced in 1979 and carried through to 1987. There seems to have been a slight uh, gap in there, but they must have realized it was a popular meter and brought it back. Anyway, so the main differences between the already uh, documented by me, IM25 and the IM16. They have the same size case, the same look. It's kind of hard to tell them apart. They have the same knobs, or the same appearing knobs in the same positions, a meter that looks about the same. But the IM25, you can tell the difference just at a glance by seeing that big black thumb wheel roller uh, between the power light and the input jack. That's been squeezed into the IM25 and so at a glance you can tell the difference between the two otherwise you'd have to get up closer and look. So focus on the IM16 now. It's a volt ohm meter. It does not measure current whereas the IM25 did measure current and it's listed here as a VOM but it's really a, uh, a, a true multimeter. Anyway, the IM16 is really only a VOM. The first of two new VOMs delivered in 1967, the other was the IM25, as I've already said, that used battery power or a built-in AC supply. The major difference between the IM16 and the IM25 is that the IM25 also included a milliamps range and that the IM16 does not require 14, count them, C batteries like the IM25 does. It has a DC voltmeter with eight ranges, 0 0.5 through uh, 1500 volts with an 11 mega ohm impedance on all. Well, it says on all ranges here, but according to the specifications we've already looked at, it's one mega ohm on the, uh, on the AC functions all ranges of the AC function so that may be correct here because the input resistance is shown kind of as part of the DC voltmeter yeah here we go AC voltmeter same DC ranges input impedance of 1 mega ohm so this is correct accuracy is only 5% of full scale so not that great it's 3% with DC volts 
And then the ohmmeter ranges, there's seven ranges with uh, a 10 ohm center scale of times one through times one meg. The power for the meter circuit, which is what they're calling the amplifier circuit here, it requires either a 120 slash 240 volt AC power source or a 9 volt battery. And then you also need a C battery, a regular C cell alkaline, or probably you know any of the older formulas that gave you 1.5 volts, but not a uh, not a NICAD, for example. It would have to be one of the older ones that provided 1.5 volts. And that is needed whether you're AC powering or 9 volt battery powering the rest of the meter circuit. Outmoded by digital products like the IM102 and IM1202, and by much smaller and more portable units like the IM104 and IM105. Weighs seven and a half pounds. So I recently finished a two-year-long restoration of a Heathkit IM25 solid-state VOM or volt ohm meter, and uh, I had never seen a companion model that came out at the same time and looks very similar. Uh, this was kind of like the cheap version of the same of the IM25, and it's the IM16. Um, I was really having a hard time finding any of these and uh, there were two or three on eBay after quite a long time passed and they were just really totally trashed. Usually the meters were shattered or gone or something. This was the only one that looked like it might be salvageable. It's uh, got all sorts of dirt on it. I don't know where it's been stored but the meter at least looks intact. The uh, I think it's been somewhere with a lot of sun because the red uh, ink on the meter is very faded. But the uh, silk screen on the front panel seems to be intact. Um, the knobs turn. All the switches seem to work. Nothing's jammed. The uh, input jack is there. The lens for the uh, neon power indicator is there. Everything's there. There's a clattering rattling inside. I don't know what's loose. I hope it's not something serious. But this might be salvageable. Okay, what are we going to find when we open this thing up? Well, it doesn't actually look too horrible inside. Uh, the thing that's uh, rattling around is the C cell that usually goes here. It came loose and it's leaked. There's leaked battery fluid all around. But uh, it looks like something stove in the front, something banged in here, but I think I can probably straighten that. GE Cole DL Cal, uh, Kansas ham radio if stolen notify phone number um, there's the uh, battery clip for the 9 volt battery that's just supposed to sit in this uh, holder there it's uh, a whole lot simpler than the IM25 but you know, the, the major components on here all look like they're in pretty good shape. I don't see a lot of corrosion or physical damage. So this uh, might be mostly a, a mechanical restoration, and maybe I don't have to do a lot with the circuitry. We'll see. There was just a lot of greasy, oily crap on here leaking out from the bottom. And I'm not sure it isn't just fluid that came out of that battery. Something broke and left parts behind. And I hope it's not something important. Oh, yep it is. It's all off of that capacitor. Which is um, busted.
not sure which capacitor that is, but I'm guessing it got hammered by that battery rattling around inside. Uh, removing the uh, nuts and washers from the controls on the front. Um, the switches have these black inserts and the potentiometers do not. Um, but I think everything's actually mounted to that internal sub-panel, so I'm not really sure what these things do. Some sort of bushing, but I don't know if it's there to provide electrical insulation or just centering or what. The thing that was preventing me from pulling the front off was the neon bulb whose lenses affixed to the outer front panel, not the structural front panel. Um, and I think the easiest thing to do... Well, I can't do anything. I can't remove this bracket because it still won't go through the hole. I think I'm just going to have to plan on snipping that out of there. I might just replace the neon bulb while I'm at it. Okay, yeah, these uh, black things are just grommets that stick in there. I don't know that I'm going to be able to get this off of here without breaking that plastic lens. That's something I definitely want to avoid doing. But I definitely want to get the meter off of here so when I try to straighten this badly bent panel I don't bang it up. Okay, bag of hardware, bag of brackets and knobs. Each one identified as to which shaft it goes on because the alignment inserts are different for every one. One blown up capacitor and another one just like it that's not blown up. I'll need to find replacements for these. I don't know if this one was just damaged by physical abuse, uh, maybe from the loose battery slamming into it enough times. Uh, maybe it was from whatever impact caused the damage to the case. Maybe it was subjected to really crazy voltages and just blew up. I don't know. It obviously had fluid in it. A lot of the fluid that was in it is what was leaking out and getting all over everything. It's way more than it came from the battery. And I think that's what it came from. Uh, this one's probably okay, but um, since I don't know what happened to this one, I'm probably going to replace both of them with something. I mean, it's a .015 microfarad. The main thing is getting the voltage right. 3,000 volts. I imagine they still make something like that. Oops. These things are still a-leaking. getting all over the place here. Um, anyway, so this part of the chassis actually seems to be very good. I don't see any corrosion on it. Um, all the resistors look good. The wiring looks good. Like I said, the pots seem to work pretty well. I might just put a tad of lubrication on the shafts, but otherwise I think they're probably okay. This panel I'll have to straighten it where it gets bent here at the end. Figure out how to do that without messing up the silk screen. That's the most important thing. I'm going to have to repaint these grody brackets or side rails. Definitely going to have to strip and repaint the bottom of the case, although it doesn't seem to be particularly bent. Um, and the top part of the case also seems to be in pretty good condition except for the paint and that it still has leakage fluid on it which I need to mop up some more. The back panel has a bit of a bend to it. I'll have to straighten that. The bezel has a bend but not as bad as the front panel and I don't want to crack that but I'll see what I can do to straighten it. The meter's probably okay it's not scratched. 
and even though the red um, soap or the red pattern, however they put that on there, lithography or whatever, is um, is faded, it's still legible, and I probably can't really do anything about that. So again, I suspect that I'm going to find that this is okay electrically once I replace those couple of capacitors this really really old looking electrolytic capacitor um, there's another one or two in there somewhere I think where does it go I thought I saw another oh yeah there's that electrolytic which should be pretty easy to replace. I'll probably do that just because the rest of it looks so wretched. Uh, as for diodes and things, they're probably okay. Um, the jack itself looks pretty good, although the nut is uh, rusted. And uh, actually these things here look pretty good. These are, this is the uh, sort of half-assed way Heath get decided to try to hold a C-cell inside this. That's just bad design. It weighs way too much to be held in place by something like this. Now, it's not intended to be a portable meter, except it's got handles on the side suggesting portability. But this is the kind of thing where if you pick it up and move it around, that battery's just going to pop right out of there. Um... So, oh yeah, the handles, uh, rubber handles with um, kind of um, metal inserts. Those will have to be taken apart and cleaned. Yeah, again, hopefully it's just a physical design thing and I won't have to do a whole lot with the circuitry. The good thing about the circuitry on here is it's got... Oops. One, two, three, four, five, six bipolar transistors and an FET, that shiny can there. And those are the exact same parts that are on the IM25, and I bought enough spare parts of both of those uh, types of transistors, even though they're obsolete, I found new old stock. Um, I bought enough extra where even when I restore my other IM2, the two IM25s that I still have waiting in the wings, uh, once I restore those, then um, there will probably be enough of those transistors left over to replace some of those if, uh, well I already know that the IM25 that I just restored had two of those FETs and only one of them was bad. so right off the bat I already have a part that I can earmark for this and I definitely bought way more of the bipolars than I needed so I've got plenty of those. The Zener diodes are just run-of-the-mill Zener diodes if they happen to be blown they should be easily replaced. Um, there's a couple of diodes hiding down under here. It's hard to get the camera at it. Um, I don't even know where it is now. It's that thing under there is a uh, there with the yellow dot on it. That's a diode. I think that's probably yeah. There's another one around there. Um, I think pretty much all the protection circuitry in here is done with transistors. So those are probably part of the rectifier uh, circuit. Um, anyway, so electrically, and the switches look really clean and they don't look banged up, so I think a little deoxid on there and those will probably work just fine. Nothing looks warped or damaged. All the precision resistors look good. They don't show any signs of overheating. There's no cracks on them anywhere I can see. So again, I think electrically this is probably in fairly good shape and if I can figure out how to straighten those bent panels um, maybe this won't be too horrible. Well I decided not to dick around with it 
this lens is probably irreplaceable so I have just removed it and to remove it I had to cut the um, whatever these things are called these uh, washers that jam on and then aren't supposed to come back off so I just cut that to get it off and um, once I straighten it I'll go to the hardware store and see if I can get another one of these and put it back on and if I can't I'll probably just use some epoxy or something to glue the lens in place okay project for another day okay all the main case components outer case components and panels and the um, side brackets are soaking in very warm soapy water and a similar mixture is being used to soak the knobs the little corner brackets for the handles and the four rubber feet for wrapping up the power cord and I did clip off the uh, power cord and did a strain relief I think the power cords almost salvageable but somebody clipped off the ground prong which is not desirable but the terminal block for that is salvageable I'll probably end up putting a different power cord on there Oh, I almost forgot. I had to pull the spring steel strips out of the handles and I've got to throw the the rubber outer parts in there as well. All right, all the panels have been scrubbed. A lot of dirt came off of them, but they still look pretty bad, but these ones it doesn't matter cuz I'm going to repaint those anyhow. This guy here it's not great it's kind of modeled I may be able to improve that with the application of something stronger than soap and water this guy is the front panel and uh, again I have the same hopes but there is definitely a demarcation line here of dirt and stuff and probably most of that won't come off now a reveal here is that I found another IM16 for sale on eBay which not only has a meter with less faded graphics on it but it also um, even though it's very dirty looking it doesn't look like it's probably got this um, so I may swap out the front and rear panels um, and then restore the other one with the less than perfect panels here or less perfect panels um, we'll see on that. And meanwhile, I've got the power cord, uh, what do you call them, the uh, hooks around which the power cord wraps up, and the handle corners, and the two handle brackets, and a sink full of pretty dirty water. Get my long screwdriver, push away the suds and see if I can find the hole down there with the lifting ring on the plug. That's my um, lift pump lifting the drain water up one level of the house. This sink drains pretty well, but as I probably mentioned earlier, I'm having a problem with this fixture here. It, it leaks out from the bottom of it. It doesn't seem to be coming from any of the gaskets for the hot and cold, and it's not coming from the water hose attachment points. It must have a crack or a defect uh, down here where the mixing of the hot and cold occurs, somewhere in that manifold. Okay, look down here. Definitely a lot of dirt down there. That's the 
brush I use for most of the scrubbing. And that's the way it goes. Well, um, I used a little bit of acetone on the front panel after first trying it on the rear panel, and it helped a lot um, as it has on some other heath kits, but it removes paint, so it has to be used very carefully. There was an area here that had a little bit of, um, let's see, yeah, I think this was the side that had some uh, battery leakage getting onto it, and the as soon as I hit it with the acetone, the paint came right off. That's partially from the battery leakage, but I had to be very careful around here, and of course the areas that received most handling are the areas most stained, and you can see here where I tried it on the off and the battery positions, and it's already lighter than the line position. I wouldn't dare try to remove more than that, so um, I think that's about as good as I'm going to get this panel. Well, I forgot to try isopropyl alcohol. That might help a little bit. Yeah, the isopropyl alcohol did nothing. So I'm hoping that the the other one I ordered has a better front panel. I know it has a better looking meter. But this is probably still a usable panel when I make the other one. Um, I also have to straighten this panel, which it's a fairly clean bend with no scraping of the paint, so hopefully I can straighten that out. And then likewise the rear panel is bent this way, but again at a nice juncture and without any rippling, so that should unbend pretty well. I used some mineral spirits on the bottom of the case to remove the remaining uh, adhesive from the old feet which we're missing. Uh, there was just little, um, well the adhesive pads that attached the rubber feet were still there but they'd lost most of their adhesive and I just used a razor blade to pry them up from the paint and then the mineral spirits to dissolve the remaining adhesive from the paint and I tried using the mineral spirits elsewhere on here and it didn't do anything to help clean this up and uh, it doesn't need to since it'll be repainted. Alright, after an alcohol wipe down of the black, paint, black painted parts, those are going to need a shot of, um, they're just a little bit too blemished. That's going to get black satin spray paint, as are these. They're not horrible, but they need a little touch up. And then the bezel, which also is a little bent and twisted. I'm going to have to try to straighten that without cracking it, hopefully. Um, that's going to need a shot of, of gloss black after I get done working on it. So I think there's some painting in my future. Oh yes, and I've also worked these over with alcohol to prep them for um, painting. And the knobs came out looking pretty good after getting all the dirt off of them. They're looking at to be in very good shape. Alright, I've used my old reliable can of Ace Premium Paint and Primer Satin Black Enamel to shoot the handle side rails and the handle uh, corner um, well they're just cover plates really so that should come out about right and now for the case outers top and bottom I've got my Rust-Oleum camouflage non-reflective finish ultra flat um, khaki which is the closest color I found to the original shade, um, which doesn't look like a good match there, but 
there was, um, I found, quite a bit of variation in these paints. Even, even Heathkit didn't seem to have good consistency on what color exactly they used for the case top and bottoms, except it was not the same color that they used for the front and rear panels of that series of equipment. So this matches some of them and not others. In this case it's going to be this because it's the color I painted everything else in this series when I restore it. All right, all those parts are painted. They seem to have come out about the way I wanted them to. I'm working on these and I got some bad running in this area. I think I'm going to have to sand that down and repaint that side. I'm working on the ends and the insides first before I do the main faces, but yeah, something happened there. And I've been trying to work this over with a Q-tip, trying to clean in between the graphics, and it's just kind of pretty badly blotchy. I think I've got as much paint off of there as I can without ruining it. And then over here I've shot the bezel with some semi-gloss uh, paint. Rust-Oleum 2X Ultra Cover Paint and Primer Semi-Gloss Black. So I'm going to let that dry and then I'm going to flip it upside down and paint the inner part from the other side. I don't know what I'm going to do with this yet because the exposed metal here is pretty gnarly looking. I don't think that Heathkit coated that with anything. I just always assumed, I don't know what these are made out of, zinc or something like that. I suppose it could be cast aluminum. I don't know. I would like to clean that up a little bit. I probably should have done that before I painted it. Uh, we'll see. So I've got three coats on the ends, and now I've got the first coat on the top and bottom faces. Next order of business, waiting for the paint to dry, will be to see what I can do to straighten these bends out. I'm a little unsure about the best strategy for this. But um, I think the key is to get something across here on the bottom for these edges to sit on and then push it down maybe just by hand and see if it'll fold more or less flat. And this will be a little more difficult here, I think. Although most of the bend is right near the corner, then it more or less flattens out. That may not be too bad. Well, let's see how this rig works. Well, that seemed to have worked out pretty well. I was able to get it pretty flat. It's laying reasonably flat along these boards. There's a slightly raised area over here which um, I laid with the block of wood under it. I laid another block here and whacked it with a hammer a few times and got it to lay flatter, but that's about as far as I can get it. Now, there's also this divot. You can kind of see it right in this area here where it's sunk in. It's indented. Something whacked on the knob there and just bent the sheet metal, so I'm going to try to just lay it flat and then hammer it through a block of wood on this side, see if I can get that to lay flatter. Yeah, that worked real well actually. Got it almost completely flat pretty easily. Uh, now, the other thing is when that got bent on the end, the side plate got angled in, but only the tab, not the actual side plate. And this side seems pretty, pretty straight. It might lead in ever so slightly, so I'm going to try to just grab those with pliers and bend them out a little bit. So I think this guy is pretty nicely straightened out now. It doesn't seem to have a twist to it or anything. The edges are straight when you look along them. 
I don't see any dimples. So, except for the blemishes and irregularities in color, this plate's about as good as I'm going to get it, I think. So, just a matter of laying part of it over the edge of the bench and uh, then laying a strip of wood across it and clamping part down with my hand to the bench and whacking the other end of the wood. I got the sides to straighten up really nice. And there was also a, um, a slight, very slight dip, so then I just laid it face down and laid a piece of wood here and there and whacked it a few times with the hammer and that took that out of it. Now, um, this mounting flange looks pretty straight, but this one is still in need of some remediation. That tab is bent and it's bent in and bent in the middle as well. So I got that straightened out. And um, now I have to check for flatness. Lay it on my table. See if any corner sits high. It is not. Uh, also to see if there's a twist to it, which I should be able to most easily tell by sitting it on its tabs flat on the bench and seeing if the other end sits flat, which it does. So I think this plate is now restored to its original shape. All right, second coat on the big sides here and I also shoot the the long edges as well to make sure they have more than one layer of paint on them. Now for the second coat I shoot it crosswise whereas the pattern was this way originally. Shoot it crosswise and then the third coat will be this way again. Well I'm really not happy with how boogered up this panel is. Uh, it's more scratched up than the front panel, although I got the color more even. Um, it didn't have all the discoloration due to handling that the front had, but I've got this uh, camouflage sand colored paint. Now it's flat, not the semi-gloss that this is, but the colors, well, it's not the same, but these caps don't really show exactly the color you get. It's decidedly lighter than the color I'm using on the uh, top and bottom of the cabinet. And I think I'm just going to try to shoot it with this. If it doesn't turn out looking the way I would like it to, then I've learned my lesson. I won't do that anymore in the future. Doesn't look too bad. It's coming together made out of the best parts of the two eBay purchases. I've uh, kept the front panel because it's in much better shape with less discoloration than the original one, but the uh, and the meter movement's much better on the second purchase. The knobs are about the same, the chassis is about the same, they both had battery leakage in them. I've cleaned them both up. Um, I've already drilled holes in that chassis for my 1.5 volt battery eliminator and the fuse I'm adding for the power. I've salvaged the best decorative uh, screws for the handles from both of them. And um, <clears throat> the case is really the worst part on the second one. I've got to knock these feet off. I've got to remove this tape. I can't do much about these holes except to put this panel on the bottom and uh, put this one on the top. Obviously somebody found it necessary to calibrate and rebias this meter fairly often and that's probably a reasonable thing to do really because these this whole series of meters is notoriously unstable but I don't want the holes on there on, on the one I'm keeping so I'm gonna flip those case parts over. Well, actually the one I'm probably going to sell is going to be this one, but I'm going to keep the uh, case parts that I've already done from the first eBay purchase 
um, <clears throat> and then make these look more presentable. Somebody stripped the old paint off and repainted them. I have no idea why. Maybe they just didn't like the color. But look what the inside is like. What a hack job. And this one's no better. I'm not sure what the best way to get that off is. I might just try sanding it off. Meanwhile, I've got that label down there soaking. And uh, I'm going to throw this one down in the water as well. Soak that label a bit. Then I have to go to work at it with a solvent remover for another label that was down here and left goop on it. All right, I just took the paint off with my uh, orbital random orbital sander. Started with some 80 grit and then smoothed it out with some uh, 150, which I think is as smooth as it needs to be with the paint. If anything, it'll give it the slightest texture, which is something that's desirable. Okay, this is the back panel of the second acquisition. I got that label off pretty well. There's just the slightest ghost of it. And the one here has a bit of a bigger ghost, but it's pretty much gone. I drilled one extra hole here for the fuse holder and just generally cleaned it up. Both the top and the bottom of the second acquisition case are ready for um, painting. I'm probably just going to give it one coat on the inside surface and then my usual three coats on the outside. And once again I'm using Rust-Oleum Camouflage non-reflective finish, ultra flat, khaki. First coat on the uh, outer surfaces. All right, third coat. They're looking pretty good. Let them dry a little longer. Um, I've reworked the original guts um, I should say the the inner chassis from the original uh, eBay purchase of the IM16 um, I just did all the improvements that I knew that it needed even though this is going to be the one I turn around and sell or try to sell the uh, the soldering work and just the craftsmanship of whoever built the second one uh, was just better and it's a better one to keep for me but I still want the other one to be in good shape so I've deoxed the contacts on the switches I've replaced the two um, capacitors which are high voltage um, types those are used as the DC blocking or AC coupling capacitors for the um, AC voltage range in and out of the um, in and out of the AC rectifier circuit and so those are replaced um, what else did I do I replaced this capacitor which looked like it had seen better days I replaced the input jack with an identical one although newer production but it's still the same switchcraft model as the old one they um, used to use plastic it's kind of interesting they they probably used to use phenolic originally then they went to plastic in the 60s or 70s and now they use uh, what looks like it's not phenolic it looks like it's a fiberglass material or some sort of other material but the, the metal parts are just the same, they just changed exactly what they're using as the insulator layers. So I've uh, put that jack in. It was actually probably functional, but it had a lot of rust on the nut and the front of the receiver, so um, it's got a new one now. 
I fixed a couple wires that were goofy. I replaced the uh, main filter capacitor for the power supply. I still need to do that on this one. If I can figure out where I put the other ones I ordered. Um, I've drilled the chassis for the battery eliminator. I've drilled the rear panel for the fuse holder just like I did on the other one. Uh, so this is probably about where it needs to be mechanically. I thought I was going to replace some of the diodes and the um, AC rectifier but I just suspected they were going to be bad but they actually tested fine so I've left them in place. Um, the only part I think may still need an, a replacement just because a lot of meters in this series do need them although that one didn't. <laughs> Uh, it's possible the FET or the two transistors that form the um, the meter driver could have issues. The FET is the most susceptible. That's the one in the metallic can there. But I have plenty of factory originals or new old stock originals for that. So if I need to, I can replace it. So here's the power supply filter capacitor on chassis number two which I'm going to replace. Uh, it's a 250 microfarad 25 volt and I had bought these nice um, Sprague Atom capacitors for all these in the series but I find myself one short and I want to keep these two for the other two IM25s I'm restoring. So I'm not going to use those up and I don't really want to place another order with DigiKey just for one part. So I've got some 25 volt uh, 470 microfarad which will be just fine. It's a little more filtering than it needs but it won't hurt anything. Well uh, that was a bit of a mistake on my part. This is actually the one I plan to keep <laughs> not the one I plan to sell. Um, I used up a atom cap on that one so I decided to go ahead and use one of the atoms on this one just because it's a better looking part closer to the original. I've noted that this is possibly a factory assembled unit. Um, there were a couple of extra stamps on the back which I removed uh, in the course of cleaning the panel uh, that suggested maybe this is one of the factory assembled ones and one of the things I noticed is that everywhere where the uh, manual calls for screws and nuts to be used they used rivets so the transformer is held with pop rivets the uh, battery brackets are held with pop rivets the circuit board is held to the chassis with pop rivets um, things like that terminal block down or that terminal strip down there is held with a pop rivet on its little angle bracket and indeed the similar one for the AC power also had a pop rivet so I think that may be a mark of how Heathkit assembled these things when it was um, done in their own factory instead of by the uh, the purchaser. Another difference is that this one resistor which is part of the overall resistor divider is mounted on the bottom of the board instead of on the top of the board and um, I noted that the position it's supposed to go in originally is in a very crowded space with uh, wiring laying up next to it and everything possibly they determined that it was just better to mount that one on the back side of the board instead of in that congested space Maybe it's just a preference of the person who did that or you know, possibly they had a, a bad resistor or it was damaged in some way and it's too hard to get in there so they just slapped it on the back. Any number of possible uh, reasons for doing that. Okay, one battery eliminator is mounted and I put in the uh, 440 threaded spacers for the other one. I 
And now that one's mounted. That's the way it looks on the other side. Two bolt heads or screw heads up above the battery holders. I've also drilled a couple of holes in the circuit board and scraped some um, silk screen off or solder mask off of the the foils for the primary side of the power transformer so I can tack on the power wires going to this and the that will just be on this side and then the DC wiring on the output will go through this hole here and loop around to the wiring that currently goes to the uh, mercury battery cell or the 1.35 volt in this case alkaline cell the battery holder for that and then I've got the other hole in here so I can bring the new line um, 120 volt line wires in from the back loop them around and have them come through the PC board holes from the direction they should these foils on this series of boards peel off very easily and um, if you've got wires hanging on just the the foil side of the board they tend to come off so that's why I'm making this modification on all of the meters I work on on this series so it's just adding a strain relief essentially here's a similar threaded spacer 440 for the fuse holder and the new uh, screw head that goes with that now I'll put this guy up here and run another screw in from the top just like that and the fuse holders mounted on the other rear panel this is the one on the, the meter that I'm going to keep at least with the mix and match parts and the other one power cord still needs to go in here I've ordered a new cord and a new uh, strain relief or cord grip but it hasn't come in another couple of days before I see that alright I've removed the two wires from the 1.5 volt battery holder that won't be used anymore and I've peeled its wires from the wire harness back to this point went through the hole I drilled in the circuit board and that pops up here and goes over to the output of the battery eliminator meanwhile I've got the uh, 120 volt AC wires just hanging out in space for the moment until I terminate those later and the other one and then the 120 volt power wires from the battery eliminator come over here and get sweat soldered to the places where I'd stripped this uh, solder mask before um, it doesn't say so and Heathkit seemed to treat hot and neutral as being interchangeable which was a failure they had back in those days they just weren't as safety conscious and there weren't as many standards to follow probably anyway so following normal conventions and the way they have things wired up uh, in the wiring diagrams the hot line should be coming in right where my thumbnail is there it goes through the switch through here and then comes over here and goes to this side of the transformer and uh, then that goes to the black lead to the battery eliminator and neutral should be here it comes in from the line goes through this contact in the switch and on this way and that's where I've got the white wire to my battery eliminator all right I'm starting to do the back panel wiring replacing the short pigtails that Heathkit designed in with a more flexible and uh, maintainable serviceable approach of being able to remove the back panel far enough to be able to do work on the circuit board something Heathkit had not allowed for so um, I've just taken a short length of black and white wire 
black being on the hot side, whether it's before or after the fuse, and um, put it into these two pin Molex connectors. Um, I'm treating this as a female socket, so it's like the rest of the meter has the male plug that will plug into the female part here in order to get the AC power. So I'm using that philosophy. So both a female socket body as well as the female uh, pins. The actual connectors are female. Now for the other side I'm going to use the the male corresponding connector with the the male pins. And the other one. Alright, the male Molex connector is going through its pair of black and white leads through the hole in the board and popping up there to go down into the holes that originally Heathkit had the AC line pigtails coming in from the rear here and down here. So now there's this strain relief built in by doing it this way. Okay, I've plugged my uh, cable together from the back panel to the circuit board. And uh, I'd left enough wire length on this to allow the rear panel to be pretty far removed by about a foot from the, the meter chassis when servicing it so you can easily get around behind it take measurements or you know desolder things and not have those really short four inch pigtail wires that Heathkit originally put in there. That's great if you're going to build it and never want to service it but uh, not so great if you actually need to work on it once you've built it. Alright let's take a look at this guy the IM16 Heathkit solid state voltmeter model IM16 it is not a volt ohm milliamp meter. It is not a VTM and it's really just a voltmeter AC and DC and ohm meter. No ability to measure current, at least not directly. If you had a precision shunt resistor then you could use this indirectly to measure current. So we have a single input jack here which receives a quarter inch phone plug from the test leads, the power on neon indicator. This fairly nice uh, generous layout to the controls. Your power switch which is off, line powered or battery powered. With the modification I've made it no longer can be powered from batteries. I've used battery eliminators inside. There is the ohms position, the DC plus and the DC minus which is just reverse polarity uh, voltage and AC voltage all selected by there. It's essentially your function switch and the uh, DC polarity switch all uh, grouped together. There's the zero adjust on the IM25 which I have two videos on there's a big thumb wheel roller right over here between the input jack and the um, neon power indicator that does the same job as the zero adjust here. Uh, then there's the ohms adjust which is for uh, full scale um, deflection when you're in the ohms mode. Then you have a, um, a volts selector which goes up in um, orders of three so 0.5 then 1.5 then it jumps to 5 then 15 then it jumps to 50 then 150 jumps to 500 then 1500 so those are your voltage ranges. For ohms it's whatever the meter says on its single ohm scale times 1 times 10 times 100 1k 10k 100k and 1 meg. Looking at the meter movement you've got the top scale in green which is the one and only ohms range or the only ohms scale I should say and that's a problem with this whole series of meters is that it only has the one scale and it's it's nonlinear and if you're working towards the left 
things are kind of tight and as you go to the right they get very nonlinear. So it can be very difficult no matter which range you're in to get a very accurate reading. You just kind of get in the ballpark with this. It's not a great ohm meter. Then for DC there are two scales in black. One of them ending at 15 and one ending at 50. You use whichever one goes with the range here. Then for AC the top two red scales once again are 15 and 5 so that again corresponds to the uh, selector switch here. Well I erred slightly. Um, if you're on one of the higher voltage ranges 50, 150, 500, or 1500 then you're supposed to be using the black scale and that's alluded to here by drawing a red line up from the AC to the DC scale. So, But there's nothing on here I can see to tell you only use the black scales when you're in the highest uh, four range positions. That really should have been color coded and some other Heathkit meters did use color coding in that way to help you out. And then the upper two red scales, the ones ending in 5 and 15, should be red when the switch is on 5 or on 15 here, but only then. So basically, for the lowest five ranges, you would use the red scales from bottom to top. If you're on the 0.5 volt range, you use the bottommost scale, which actually goes up past 0.5 to 0.65. If you're on the 1.5 volt range, you use the second scale from the bottom, which extends past 1.5 up to 1.8. If you're on the 5 volt range, then you just use the one ending in 5. If you're on the 15, then you use the 15. And then again, as I already said, for the 50, 150, 500, and 1500, you just use uh, whichever of the two black scales is appropriate. I believe that's because of the way they handled the uh, AC rectification. Depending on the voltages, you've got different numbers of diodes in series with the uh, signal, therefore extra drop that has to be compensated for with different scales on the meter. Taking a look inside, First off, we have the rear of the meter movement. It takes up a lot of space because the meter has such a large face on it. And of course the wiring going to the meter. Then we have the calibration panel, which has a pot for AC calibration, one for DC calibration, and one for bias, which really just adjusts the limits of the zero control down here. Uh, places it up and down a little bit, allows you to get the meter um, reading electronically at zero when it should be. Then there are the four selector switches which have several wafers on each one and of course the big wiring harness tying things together. Some of the wiring from the switches is done through the circuit board and some is done by point-to-point -point wiring to the wiring harness or between the switches or to components mounted directly on the switches. For example, the three diodes of the AC rectifier for the AC voltage range are right on this wafer. Uh, there are some additional resistors on there. Uh, the AC coupling capacitors, those big black ones. There's two of those guys, the other one's way down in there. And of course the power transformer for when you're running it on line power. And as I've modified this one, it only runs on line power now. And let's see, um, most of these other resistors here, this big stack of them and then going across and so on, those are all comprising the precision voltage divider that's used for all functions. Over here is my uh, battery eliminator for the 1.5 volt C cell that would normally go in this position. Uh, the corrosion on this was very bad from a battery that was left in here and all the hardware was rotted out. 
I had to brush and file way down to get past most of the corrosion on the aluminum bracket. I probably would have removed it if it wasn't for the fact it was riveted in there and I didn't want to mess it up. This little uh, box here is where a 9 volt battery would go and that 9 volt battery, just a normal 9 volt battery, um, that is used for powering most of the meter circuitry uh, when you're running in battery power mode. The 1.3 or 1.5 volt C cell that would be there is used only for the ohms mode as a voltage reference for a constant current source. All of the power for operating the meter movement circuitry comes from the 9 volt battery. But that already has a battery eliminator built in when you're in the line position on the front, so I didn't need to make one for that. Alright, so let's see here. So there again is the top of my battery eliminator for the 1.5 volt battery. There's the back of the circuit board. And uh, there's my fuse and where the AC line cord comes in. Okay, here's the view of the bottom. There's a better view of the fuse. Um, the other side of the battery eliminator. Uh, better view of the power supply components and somewhat better view of the switches and their wiring. Now way over at this end of the board are the um, let's see if I can get a better angle on this there are it looks like uh, five transistors one of which is an FET and the others are of which are bipolar transistors Oh, there's another one over here, so five bipolars and an FET. Those are all used either as um, current sources for various things, uh, in other words, constant current sources, or they're used as part of differential amplifiers to drive the meter movement, and the FET itself is the front-end impedance buffer circuit, and um, all these non-precision resistors surrounding them are all associated with that functionality. They're not part of the front-end precision rectifier circuitry. Okay, for a bit of a demo, I've got this uh, probe plugged in. This is the same probe that I've talked about in some of my other videos. I'll try to put a link or a description in the caption of the video. It uh, electrically duplicates the original Heathkit VTVM probe that they used on all of the VTMs and also all of the solid state meters in this series. Uh, the red probe is one that has a 10 meg ohm resistor in series between the wire lead and the tip of the probe. And that's only used for measuring DC volts. For measuring AC volts or for measuring ohms one must use another probe which is black in color and is marked AC and ohms. So I've got the uh, alligator clip for the common or negative and the red DC volts probe clipped up to my bench power supply. I'm going to first turn the uh, meter on. I got my light here and the meter is off scale to the left. Now I should be able to turn the adjust knob. There it goes. until I get zero. So that's the function of this. It's not the meter zero, it's zeroing the electronics so that the meter reads zero. And I'm gonna start with um, the five volt range here. And every time you change these things you have to re-zero the meter. It's a problem with this whole series. They were all kind of unstable in that way. I'm in DC plus here and I'm gonna dial my power supply 
uh, come on, there we go. It's set to one volt. I'm going to turn it on. And since I'm in the five volt range, I would expect to be reading on this scale here. And I'm right on 10. But since I'm on the five volt range, it's only one. So let's go up to four volts. And I'm pretty much right on the four there. If I go to five, it's slightly over. I can turn the power supply off and see if I've drifted any on my zero. Looks like I have slightly. Zero it out. Turn the power supply back on. And now I'm right on five. So again, this whole series of meters was known for being kind of drifty and unstable. I think that's probably why they didn't last very long in Heathkit's lineup. It seemed like you're probably forever zeroing it and readjusting it. You know, every measurement you take, and probably more than once on some measurements, especially if you have to change ranges in the course of taking a measurement. So let's go up to the 15 volt range, and once again I have to turn my power supply off and see how my zero is doing. It's pretty good, but it could use a little adjustment. Turn my power supply back on, and now I'm on the 15 volt range, so I should be using this guy, and it's right on 5. If I go up to 7 volts, it's right on 7. If I go up to 12, it's pretty much right on 12. And I'll go up to 50 volts. I won't re-zero it at the moment. I'm going to check and see if it's pretty close to 12, and it is. There's 10 and there's 12. And I'll go up to 24 volts. It's pretty much right on the money. And I'll go up to my power supply's maximum of 32 volts. And it's right on the money there. So the DC volts function is working pretty well. Okay, I've switched over to the AC volts position. I've set it up to a 150 volt range. I've got the black lead and the alligator clip clipped up to some short jumpers which go ultimately to the output of my AC access panel which is in turn plugged into my Variac which is set to 120 volts. Um, so I'll turn the switch on and let's see so I'm in one of the higher ranges so I should be using the 150 scale here and it's reading about 120. Well, it's reading 12, but it's 120. So that's pretty good. Now let's see what happens when I crank it down to approximately 100 volts. Well, the knob on the Variac is not that precise. So it's pretty much there at 100 volts. So it should be about 50 now, and it is. And maybe a little bit lower than 20. And it's pretty much there, just a little bit below the 2 on the scale. So the AC volts is working. I don't have a good source of other AC voltages unless I hook up a transformer or make a big voltage divider or something. So it's all the same circuitry on here. I'm proving the whole circuit by using it to measure a line voltage. Um, it's all the same. It uses fewer series diodes in the rectifier, the signal rectifier that is, if you're on a lower voltage range. So I'm passing through all of the diodes now since I'm on one of the higher voltage ranges. Okay, I've got the meter on ohms. I've set it to the lowest range and I've got it connected up to my Heathkit decade resistance box. Just for the moment I'm going to unclip the minus side and clip it directly to the plus side and make sure that the zero is correct. Looks like I need to adjust the zero here. Um, there we go. And then when I leave it open 
it should be reading full scale and I can adjust the ohms function here to get it to be full scale and now I'll connect the clip back to the box here but it's currently set to nothing so it's still an open circuit okay I'm gonna select it to 4 ohms and um, I have to read off this one scale it's reading about 5 ohms and that's not surprising there is no calibration for ohms on this it's just trusting on the overall um, uh, accuracy of all the resistors inside but this uh, decade box has possibly the better part of an ohms resistance on it so we can't really believe it that much let's try taking it up to um, 40 ohms and now it's way up here somewhere let's put it on the times 10 range so it's not super accurate um, it should be reading closer to 4 here and it's kind of up towards 5 so it's kinda of like yeah it's it's not a very accurate meter I know that my um, battery eliminator is putting out the correct voltage so um, it's not a reference problem there but that's again a problem with these meters there's not much I can really do for that well I just lifted the lead off and uh, the meter is way up here so it needs to be readjusted I have to adjust the ohms knob again again these are kinda drifty so now I'll reconnect this and see if it's closer to the correct reading and yes it is well, I also didn't check zero very well did I yeah zero's off too let's adjust the zero control get zero up to where it should be let it go open adjust the ohms for the proper position there and now I'll go back and try to read something and it should be closer to four and it is so it's doing better now it just you have to remember to constantly be twiddling these knobs and checking it because it'll just drift all over the place now the IM25 that this is a simpler version of it's really about the same circuitry but the IM25 has all these extra things in there like temperature compensation uh, extra amplifier stages and things that are supposed to improve on the stability issues and I think it does this is really the low-end model and so it's lacking some of those stability features anyway let's continue to go on with this here um, I'm gonna bring up uh, 600 on here so it should be about 640 ohms if we look here uh, that's 50, 60, 70, so it's reading closer to uh, 70 times 10, so 700 ohms. Uh, but again, I've changed ranges, so I really should check that that's still correct and short it and make sure the zero is still good. And it's sitting a little high. So let's go back to infinity. That's still about where it should be. Reconnect the, re the decade box. It's still reading about the same place. I didn't really help it. But again, that's about the most accuracy you can expect out of this. Now, I can go up to another range. So this is where things are very nonlinear and really bunched together. So I can go up to the 100 multiplier and assuming it hasn't drifted let's check go to zero it's pretty good so again we're looking for 640 
and uh, this is the 600, there's the 700, so uh, 600, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not great, but it's, it's in the ballpark. If it were 650, it should be right in between the 6 and the 7. It's a little bit on the low side. So again, accuracy, you have to read the whole thing in such a tiny little area. Let's uh, go up to 830 ohms. And again, it's like, well, 850 ohms would be the dash between the 8 and the 9. Maybe I can go to the 1K. And now we're over here where the pointer's right about on the line that would be an 8, or a point eight times 1K, which is 800. So, again, it's about right. All right, let's jump around here. Let's go up to the highest this thing can go is, let's say, 700... 50k and I'll turn everything else down. It won't matter to this because the resolution is so bad. I could mess around with these lower order knobs and you wouldn't even know it. I could barely get it to register, you know, two digits of resolution equivalent on the analog scale. So it should be 750k now. Obviously it's way up here. So I have to go up to the 10k multiplier. And if I do that it's five, six, seven hundred. It's reading closer to eight hundred. But again, I've changed a couple ranges, so I should re-zero it. It's reading just a tad high. Zero it down. And then leave it go open. And that's still right where it should be. So once again, um, 750 it's still reading closer to uh, 800k, but let's go to a more accurate range. Yeah, that's pretty much right on now. It's right about between the 7 and the 8, so 750 with the 100k multiplier. I can also put it on the 1 meg multiplier, and then I'll look at it way down here. So it's between the 6 and the 8. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, so it's it's in the ballpark. The most accurate reading is going to be the 1 in the 100k range that gets into the best part of the scale. Um, anyway, I think it's drifted again. Let's <laughs> double check it one more time. Yeah, it sagged a little bit. Bring it up. Now, meters like this probably perform a little better if you let them warm up a bit. Um, this model doesn't have any thermal stabilization at all in it, where its big brother, the IM25, has a couple of transistors that are there to counteract just general warming up of the circuit. So, um, I can expect some drifting on here. The full scale is still good. Yeah, so 750, it's pretty much as accurate as you could ask it to be uh, in the 100k range. And back in the 1 meg range, again, it's, it's not as accurate. Anyway, so this meter is working just fine, probably as good as it ever did when it was new. And the battery eliminator is working fine, too. Now the case bottom needs some feet. And once again, I've got my, part of my depleting stock of 3M bump-on feet, which are the same exact kind and shape and size as Heathkit would have originally provided, but they would have provided brown ones instead of black ones. But these days, it's really hard to get anything except black unless you buy thousands of them but the black ones you can get on Amazon. Alright, those guys are on now.
the original nickel plated screws that Heathkit provided for holding the top and the bottom of the case on are pretty bad. And these are actually some of the better ones. So I'm not going to put those on. They're too ugly. Instead, I buy from boltdepot.com. They have a wide variety of high quality screws and no minimum order. Um, I actually have more of these on order since I've been using so many of them. But this is just a pack of eight of them, which is enough for this one meter. These are 632 Heathkit, loved 632. Practically every screw that could be a 632 was a 632 and quarter inch long. And uh, they're just almost identical to the originals. And these are stainless steel, if I didn't say so already. So they should not get corroded like the old ones. Okay, there's the bottom of the case put on. One more look before buttoning it up. Okay, the entire thing is put back together. Got these uh, pull-out handles on the sides. Very uncomfortable handles because you always get your fingers pinched against all the sharp edges. Not really all that practical, but he sure made a lot of products with that design in the late 60s. All right, and there's the rear view, very plain rear on this. Nothing on it except for the uh, hooks to wrap the power cord up on. And the label, of course. Okay, here's the beauty shot. Did I mention that the IM-16 is a kind of watered-down, stripped-down, cheapified version of the IM-25? Well, there's actually another meter in the same series that uses the same circuit philosophy and was clearly designed by the same design team, but it's even cheaper. It does what this one does, the IM-16, but with fewer ranges and even less accuracy and stability. And I'm just going to give you a quick preview of it. This one still needs to be restored. It's the IM-17. It's got various cosmetic issues and electrical issues, although it's basically working. And I'll be doing another video on this. So again, really the same idea, but going to um, screwdriver or finger adjust shafts instead of knobs but the same two as these knobs here uh, AC and DC volts and resistance all with one selector knob and only four ranges per function uh, an AC DC polarity but our switch and an on and off switch and it's only um, battery powered this is a portable instrument anyway so I'll be doing another video on that once you uh, get a taste for one, you want to get the whole set. All right, let's look at the manual for the IM-16. This is a complete reproduction of the original Heathkit manual for the IM-16. I was not able to lay my hands on an original, although there are full scans of the original available online. Um, but I bought this from Manual Man, as I've bought many manuals when I uh, don't want to just use scans. Um, I buy them from Manual Man. There's all the information, manualman.com. He provides a high quality manual. I don't know where he gets his scans from, but the manuals are complete. 
done on quality paper and um, if there were any markings or any things in the original he removes them so uh, anyway so table of contents The Heathkit model IM16 solid-state voltmeter combines the features of a vacuum tube voltmeter and the portability of a volt ohmmeter in an attractively styled cabinet. Operation is from the power line or from internal battery as selected by a single switch. Battery operation permits accurate voltage and resistance measurements to, at remote locations without an AC power source. All measurement functions, AC volts, DC minus or DC plus volts or ohms are selected by one switch. Separate range switches are provided for volts and ohms. Voltage readings as low as 0 0.01 volt and resistance readings from 0.2 ohms to over 500 mega ohms are read on the large 6 inch meter. The separate scales for the lower AC voltage ranges are required to follow diode response at the lower applied voltages. Additional features of the solid state voltmeter include a printed circuit board and a cable assembly for easy and neat construction, a single test probe to eliminate tangled test leads, and a dual winding power transformer that allows you to wire the voltmeter to operate from either a 120 or 240 volt AC power source. And there's the parts list. It's not a very complicated kit, so it's only two sides of one page for all the parts. Then we get right into the step-by-step -step assembly. And there's a um, fold-out parts identification pictorial. And some assembly diagrams. Some detailed wiring diagrams. Mounting various things to the front panel. Fold out for some switch wiring and chassis wiring. On the rear side of it, it's got more of the same. Mounting the sub panel. The, uh, as I should say, the chassis, the front subpanel, and the bezel together with the side rails. Some wiring directly to the back of the circuit board for the AC power line. Wiring the power cord. Another fold out pictorial. This is some additional switch wiring. and a bit more uh, of the wire harness and then assembly of the special heath kit uh, probe there's uh, some final mounting of various parts pushing the knobs on mounting the meter how to insert the batteries more details on assembling the probe calibration only one and a half pages final assembly operation several pictorials for calibration front panel reading the meter another fold out diagram this starts getting into the um, the circuit theory, so it's one of those that can be folded out and studied. More um, more details on how to measure various things in case of difficulty and troubleshooting. Maintenance information on accessory probes, specifications. For the DC voltmeter, the input uh, imp 
impedance is 11 mega ohms on all ranges. On AC volts, it's only 1 mega ohm, so big difference there. Circuit description. And uh, there are some fold out diagrams explaining various parts of it. This is really the uh, the AC functionality, that earlier fold-out was for DC functionality, and then the meter driver and um, impedance matching or um, input buffer are all explained there. Power supply, functional parts list. This is something that Heathkit was doing for a while during this time, but they didn't do it for very long in my experience looking at various manuals. They uh, probably didn't bother on the more complicated kits, but they would actually go down and explain what every part does in the circuit. There are two circuit board views the x-ray view looking at it from the component side and then the uh, same view actually uh, but this time showing various test voltage test points rather most of which are over here and then um, this is the functional diagram that goes with the circuit description that deals with the uh, ohms function some chassis photographs. Well, there's one replacement parts list. A couple blank pages. And then the um, trifold electrical schematic. Now, Manual Man, I think, cheated a little bit here. All the things that are supposed to be round are slightly ovaloid. Transistors are a little bit ovaloid, so I think just to get it to fit on an 11 by 17 piece of paper, he had to scrunch the um, the scanned image a little bit to make it fit. But it's only a slight distortion. That's uh, better than having it broken up into separate pages. And then finally, they even reproduce the uh, parts ordering forms and uh, some of the old Heathkit parts identification sketches that were on the inside covers of the manuals. Alright, time to start putting all the remaining pieces together to make the other IM16. Again, this is a combination of the rougher parts from uh, both kits, both the first and second eBay acquisitions, the parts that I have not used to complete the first one, uh, and things like these screws here are in pretty rough condition. I'm probably not even going to use those. I have ordered more from Bolt Depot. I had to buy a new, uh, whatever these things are called, washers that you push on over axles. And that's what's appropriate for this lamp. I still need to clean that up. I'm going to start out by um, putting on these screws and putting the, the, um, the hooks for the power cord on the back panel. Yay, the new DigiKey order came in along with a nice power cord. Um, these days I just order ones that have uh, a normal American... North American three-prong plug on one end and an IEC female on the other end. And if I just want a cord without the IEC, I just cut the IEC end off. And these are about a quarter inch OD, sort of a standard size, unless you're going to the higher wire gauges. I believe these are 18 gauge wires. And I bought, I think it's a Heiko 1150, a classic. It's actually um, the same class of Heiko strain relief that this panel was designed for. It has the slightly flatted side 
uh, otherwise round hull. And luckily I have a HACO installation tool so it just popped right in there. You can do this with channel locks or needle nose pliers but it's a lot harder. So that's in there and now I just have to solder these wires up. Okay, there's that. Alright, just checking calibration on the second IM16. I'm in the DC volts plus range. The meter is powered. I'm in the 1.5 volt range. And uh, let's see. I'm going to take my power supply and turn it to 1.5 volts. And I had calibrated this yesterday and it looks like it's sticking pretty close to the correct position. Let's see if I knock it down to 1 volt. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit high, but um, this is what I experienced yesterday. I think this meter movement's a little sticky. Yeah, I tap on it a few times and then it goes right down to the the 10 position, which is a 1 position in this range. And then if I drop it down to 0.5 volts, yeah, it's right on 0.5 volts. If I tap it, it'll be even closer. I've gone to 2 volts, it's overranged. I go to the 5 volt range, and it's right on the 2. I go to 5 volts. On the 5 volt range, it's right on. Go to the 15 volt range. Uh, it's right on the 5 here, so that's good. Go to 10 volts. It's a little bit low, but if I tap it, it goes up to 10. That's why I say I think the meter movement is sticky. The electronics are trying to drive it to the right position, but it's probably just because it's a very old movement, maybe it hasn't been used for a long time, it's just a little stiff, and it'll get close to the right position then just kind of bind a little bit. And if you come from the top down, it's likely to bind on the high side of the number. If you're going from the bottom up, it tends to bind on the low side, so that supports that theory. Let's go to 15 volts. Yeah, again, let's tap on a little bit. Yep, goes right to 15. And I'll go to the 50 volt range, and we're on 15. I'm going to crank her up to 20 volts. And since it was coming from the bottom, it's stuck. It's a little bit shy of 20. This time it doesn't want to come quite up to it, but it's been doing pretty good except for that stickiness. So I'm going to say that's working. Now here's the thing, when you change ranges, the zero can drift on this. So um, I'm going to re-zero it. And try to take the power supply back to, say, 25 volts and just see if that made any difference. I don't know, now it's on the low side. Yeah, so it's not it's not great, but again the accuracy of this meter is only five percent. So you know <laughs> you can be pretty far one way or the other and still technically be within specifications on this. I really can't calibrate it any better than that, so I'll take it down. Now, I'll say a little bit about the restoration of this besides what I already did. I did have to go in here and change most of the transistors that are down in this part of the circuit board. It was working, but working really badly um, when I first tried to calibrate it. I just couldn't get it to stay in calibration. It was drifting all over the place. 
the, the meter was very nonlinear in its response. So I went ahead and changed the FET, and that helped a little bit, but the FET doesn't work well without its constant current sink, which is a regular NPN bipolar transistor. So I replaced that, and both transistors were replaced with uh, new old stock original parts. So I didn't substitute some other weird kind. Uh, so with that, it got a lot better, but it still seemed like the meter drive was a little weak. And I wasn't sure if it was the sticking meter or just weak electronics. Um, some parts that, you know, just weren't working per spec anymore. So I went ahead and changed the uh, two transistors that are uh, the meter uh, drive differential amplifier and changed those out. It seemed like it might have helped a little bit, but ultimately I have that sticky meter issue, and even those transistors being brand new can't overcome that. One thing that's a problem is I don't have my um, lamp here. I had um, replaced the bulb in that, but it's not lighting up, so I have to investigate that, see what's going on. Okay, I've tweaked the AC Cal trim potentiometer to get a reading of about 10 on the 15 volt scale, which is the appropriate scale to use for the 150 volt range. It's only the lower voltages that use the red scales, even in AC volts. So again, the accuracy is not going to be great on this, but it gets you a ballpark. If I take my Variac down to about 50 volts, yeah, I'm about 5 on this scale, so the AC volts is working. Okay, for ohms, I'm going to go into the ohms mode and adjust the zero adjust. Well, I'm not doing zero. Yeah, I am shorted out here. I've got the leads shorted out on my Heathkit decade resistance box, so I'm going to Turn the zero pot until I bring it up to zero. And then I'm going to open the connection. And then turning the ohms adjust knob. Try to get it to go up to the infinity point up here. And then reshort it out over here, and it should go back to about zero. I'll readjust it, go to infinity again, retweak it here. Okay, so that should be functioning now. I connect it up to my decade box and uh, it's reading pretty close to zero. I'm in the lowest ohms mode or the lowest ohms range. I'm going to go up to about uh, 5 ohms and it'll be up in this ballpark. There is no calibration for this, it's just whatever it is. Accuracy is really low in the ohms range. Let me uh, go up to about 70 ohms, and it's actually pretty close. It's 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, yeah. So that's it's pretty much right on there. Um, now I can go to the um, times 10 mode, and I should see, yeah, it's on the 7 here. So 7 times 10 is 70 ohms. Let me take it up to um, 400 ohms, 470, <clears throat> and this is 30, that's 50, so 40 is halfway in between, and it's almost half a notch to the right of that, so about 45, uh, 450 ohms rather, 45 on here times 10, so that seems to be working. Um, let's go to the 100 times scale, 
and it's reading a little bit halfway between 4 and 5 there so that's about right for 470 ohms. I'm gonna take the times 10 down here and bring it up to 600 ohms and add 3k so it should be 3.6k uh, now well, let's see, so we're up here, that's 40 is about there, so the meter's reading a little low. Let's take it in the 1K range, and here it's reading halfway between the 3 and the 4, uh, so it's reading about 3.5 times 1K, so it is reading really close to what it should be. Let's bring in um, 70k up here and I'll take this guy down. There's no point in going past two, digit of, two digits of resolution. So it's now 73k. And uh, it's up here at about the 70 position. It's not showing me the, the 3 but it's you know, 70 times 1K, so 70K, it's pretty close. Let's bring up uh, 200K, so 270K. Uh, well, it's way up here too high, but it is close to the, the 200 here times 1K, so 200K. But we really should be in a higher range, so... I'll go down here. Well, it's reading close to uh, 3 here when it should be a bit lower. Let's try going to the 100k range. So here it should be again 2, 7. And um, it's pretty close. It's more like 2, 6. But obviously the ohms function is working it's just working only as well as this meter design allows it to work so that proves out that the ohms functionality is working here and that the battery eliminator I installed back here is doing its job okay well the problem with the neon bulb is just my sloppiness I checked where I terminated the wires from the bulb and they're not soldered. If I go over here and push on one of them with an insulated pliers, bulb lights up. Just needs a spot of solder. Alright, let's try turning it on now and see what happens to the bulb. Ta-da! That was fixed. All right. Time to button this guy up. Okay, here's the beauty shot. All right, let's take a look at the circuitry. Now this meter is getting a lot simpler than the previous one, so I'm going to try to do this without resorting to my um, redrawing of the circuit through my own sketches. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be necessary for this because it's a much simpler design. But again, it's got all the same circuit philosophy. They just kept dropping off some of the nicer touches uh, as the price went down um, with the IM25 being the most deluxe version. Let's start with the power supply. So we've got our incoming AC power cord. The ground lead is connected to the chassis. 
the hot and neutral sides of the power line. They're not identified here, but I'm treating um, the side that goes to the resistor for the neon bulb as being the hot. So let's call this the hot side. And that gets switched through only when the power switch is in the line position. Likewise, the neutral side only goes through if you're in the line position. You've got a double winding primary on the transformer and they're in series if it's wired for 240 volts and they're wired in parallel if it's wired for 120 volts. So right now the uh, connection shown here with the X is for 120 volt operation. So the hot is applied to here and also to here, the top side of both windings, and the neutral is applied to the bottom side of both windings. Now if you wired it for 240 volts, instead of having this set of X jumpers here, you would just have a wire from here to here. So the hot would be here, it would go to this winding, then immediately down to the other winding and have them in series. There's only one secondary winding on the transformer. There's a half wave rectifier with one diode and a 250 microfarad filter capacitor. The current load is quite low on this and that's all it really needs to provide a, a smooth but unregulated voltage. But the circuit does not need to be regulated to operate properly. Regardless, the power is fed through a 2700 ohm resistor to another wafer on the power switch. Again, if you're in line position, that power just goes straight through and up to what's identified as B plus or battery plus. If you've got the switch in the battery position instead, then nothing that's done over here makes any difference. And the battery here, a 9 volt battery, just a regular 9 volt radio battery, through a uh, 360 ohm resistor, looks like a 300 instead of a 5600, doesn't it? Could be 5600. That's a more common value. I'm going to say that's what it is. Then the, the voltage from there is applied through the switch here and to B+. The minus side of the uh, battery eliminator, which is really what this power supply is, or the minus of the battery itself are the same point in the circuit and they're called B minus. Now whether or not you're uh, coming up with this filtered but unregulated power supply from the battery eliminator or whether you're providing power from the 9 volt battery, either way you've got a Zener diode across this here. This Zener diode is a 6.8 volt Zener, so that makes the voltage between B plus and B minus 6.8 volts. Now that power is used to operate the meter circuit, which is this. In other words, the circuit that provides the motive power to swing the meter around. And it also provides a bias voltage which establishes everything in front of it where that's referenced within the B plus to B minus voltage span. And that's done with this combination of the zero adjust potentiometer on the front panel and the two halves of the bias adjust potentiometer which is an internal potentiometer. You have to take the top cover off to get at it. But when you turn the screw adjustment for it, it turns both that and this one together. So as you turn it clockwise, it's essentially taking this point and this point with this potentiometer in between them and moving them up. So there's less resistance up here and more resistance down here. If you turn the pot, the other the bias adjusts the other way. It moves this stuff down and makes more resistance up here and less resistance here. It's really just giving a general span 
to the zero adjust pot. If you have this set to approximately the center of its rotation, you want to have it balanced with the rest of the circuit so that that will give you a zero on the meter. And then you can turn it a little bit clockwise or counterclockwise from there to adjust the zero up and down. But you want it to be approximately in the right place when this pot is centered. And that's what these two adjustments here do. Let's start by looking at what happens when you've got a DC voltage being measured. Here's a uh, schematic of the probe which has an AC ohms or DC switch on it. The probes I have don't have this uh, switch in them so there's just a separate probe, a black one that's for AC and ohms and a red one that's for DC but electrically it's the same thing. When you're in the DC position you have a 1 mega ohm resistor in series with the probe and when you're in AC or ohms you don't, don't have that resistor. So we're in DC uh, volts, so the point of the probe comes through this one meg resistor, comes down here, you go through the input jack, it's presented to the function switch, and let's just say we're in DC volts, so it comes down this way, and it's brought around here, and continues all the way up to the top of this large voltage divider made of, of all these resistors, the bottom of which is connected back to the other probe or the alligator clip or the negative side of the probe if you will. So any voltage you're measuring between these two points is impressed across all these resistors here. If we have a relatively low voltage being measured, that voltage is dropped across the whole lot of resistors here. And because we'll have the voltage range switch selected to 0.5 um, here, that's the lowest voltage range, we're just tapping right off the top and coming on out to the rest of the meter circuit. In other words, we're not attenuating the input at all. But if you move it down to say 1.5 volts, now we're reading off of this point in the voltage divider instead of off the top of the voltage divider. So we get a lower voltage here for whatever voltage was out here. Well, it should be pretty obvious that this circuit here, everything to the right, is expecting to see about 0.5 volts full scale all the time. And it's the job of this voltage divider to make sure it sees about 0.5 volts full scale, regardless of what range we're measuring out here. So the higher the voltage we're expecting to read there, the further down in this voltage divider we tap off with the voltage range switch. And then that reduced voltage that's between 0 and 0.5 volts is passed on Again, let's say we're in the DC plus position, so it just goes through here, goes through another resistor, and then to a capacitor, it's a filter capacitor, and it goes all the way back down here to chassis ground and back to the meter common. So you've got essentially a little um, RC filter here presented at this point in the circuit. Then there are these two transistors that are wired up uh, as diodes back to back, or not really back to back, but parallel pointing in opposite directions. And those are going to have a uh, breakdown of you know about 0.6 volts or so. Since we're not expecting to see a higher voltage here than 0.5 normally, these transistors start conducting once the voltage gets much higher than that, and they essentially short this point back down to the circuit common or the ground. That's why the meter doesn't slam over to the right if you provide a higher voltage to the probes 
than the range switch is set for. This is protecting the meter and the circuitry over here. Uh, these also could be looked at as having a Zener diode functionality, but uh, practically speaking, we're just treating these as diodes. So once again, we know we're expecting to get somewhere in the area of 0.5 volts in order to get a full-scale reading on the meter if you've selected the range correctly. Now let's look at what happens if we're reading AC volts. So now we've got the probe in the position where it does not have the 1 meg resistor. The voltage is applied directly through the AC switch here and immediately encounters a series capacitor which blocks any DC voltage and allows only AC to go through. Uh, it could be AC riding on a DC signal, in which case this capacitor strips out the DC component and leaves only the alternating part to be measured. There is a dual set of contacts on the range switch to handle uh, AC volts. Normally it's the same thing, so we'd come in here, let's say we're on the 0.5 volt range, the signal comes through the uh, AC coupling or DC blocking capacitor, 0.5 volts, straight through here, 0.5 volts, and through a single diode and on out, but there is a capacitor from there back to circuit common, so that acts like a little filter. It's almost the same thing as what's happening down here in the power supply, a half-wave rectifier and a filter capacitor. So that's really the same thing you have here and you'll end up with something like an average signal at this point and then once again if the switch is in AC that signal which is now a DC signal comes up here it goes through this 3.3 meg resistor and it's going to the same place as the DC signals would be of course when you're in AC then it's disconnected here so it's as if this part of the schematic isn't even there you're just coming in straight in this way and then you would, you're applying to the um, top of the voltage divider here. Now this is the same voltage divider that's used for DC volts but it's also being used for AC volts once the signal has come through the rectifier here and uh, we need to have some adjustment there, but for the most part, the AC range switch just passes the signal straight through the switch and on out up to 150 volts. That's true. Once we get to 500 volts, now the path is like this. We come through here. We go through here and down to a, a 500 volts, and now we have to go through two diodes in series with the original diode, so three diodes in series. And that's done because the voltage capability, the voltage rating of these diodes is nowhere near high enough to allow it to go up to 1500 volts. So once it gets up into something over 150 volts, then we're forcing the signal to go through two additional diodes just so that you can divvy up the voltage that's being applied to those three and each one sees a third of the voltage so it's within their ratings but that does result in a voltage drop that's greater than if you went through just one diode so some compensation has to be made on that account now when you get up to 1500 volts now the signal path is through this resistor and then this resistor back to circuit common, it's a voltage divider. And so you have a reduced voltage here. It's passed through here and then goes through these two diodes and on out and everything's the same. Except that when we're at this part of the main voltage range switch, there are some things that are being done a little differently with the voltage divider. So we're tapping off of here for 150 volts, 
we're tapping off of here for 500 volts and for uh, 1500 volts you're tapping off of down here all well and good but over here we're actually tapping off of the 500 volt range when we're or the 500 volt tap point when we're in 1500 but again that's only used for AC so I already said before that the signal comes out of the rectifier and goes through here is presented to the voltage divider it goes through this switch and then also has to go through this switch this part of it because only DC signals can bypass this switch the AC has to go through this additional stage everything from 0.5 up to 500 are treated the same and the signal just passes through and continues on but if you're in 1500 you're actually tapping off the 500 volt tap point now why would you do that how does that work well remember back here when we're in 1500 and only when we're in 1500 we have this voltage divider here so it's knocking down the input voltage before it's applied to the rectifier and therefore we it's a, a third as much 500 is a third as much as 1500 so because of the attenuation here we don't need the attenuation here and we can tap off of the point in the resistor divider that's a third as much as it would be for 1500 but use that for 1500 it all comes out the same in the wash so to speak and the end result is that at this point in the circuit you're getting um, about 0.5 volts for a full-scale meter reading now let's look at the ohms function in order to measure resistance there are several techniques that can be used for measuring them the way this meter does it is it passes a constant current through the resistor under test and that develops a proportional voltage across the resistor but this meter does something a little trickier and in my opinion worse because what if you look at most multimeters there will be a voltage divider resistor network that's used for AC and DC volts then there will be another set of uh, if it's capable of measuring current there will then be a set of shunt resistors that are separate from the main voltage divider and the current being measured is passed through the shunt and then the voltage developed across the shunt is measured by the normal voltmeter part of the circuitry and then if you're doing current you have a constant current source that's part of the meter it passes the current through the resistor under test and that develops the proportional voltage it's just sort of the opposite of what's done for measuring current in both cases you're measuring a voltage drop across a resistor but when you're measuring current the current is external and the resistor you're measuring across is internal when you're measuring uh, a resistor the resistor you're measuring across is external and the source of the current is internal but in order to use the same set of resistors for everything the Heathkit designers for um, the IM25, the IM16, and the IM17 and by extension the IM5217 all use this stunt where they use the same set of resistors pushed into duty for all the all the functions so what they're actually doing here is they still have to have the constant current source you have a battery here that's providing the excitation voltage for the ohmmeter circuit remember that if we're measuring voltage the power to run all this circuitry comes from whatever you're measuring the external circuit is providing the power to run this front end of the meter but when you're in ohms you're not hooked up to anything that will provide power you're just hooked up to a resistor so there has to be power coming from somewhere and to cause current to move through this circuit and that's coming from this battery so that's why it's called the excitation power source 
and that's a 1.5 volt battery, um, 1.5 volt alkaline nominally. And that is wired again when you're in either battery or line because this battery is needed regardless of whether you're running the meter, the rest of the meter off of a battery or off of the line voltage, you still need this battery all the time. But you don't want it when the meter is off because it would deplete this battery. So if you're in line or battery, the plus side of this battery is passed through and then if you're in ohms, it goes through this switch and it's applied to the top side of this uh, 10 ohm resistor. And then the current that's flowing from the battery goes through here through the resistor and comes back comes here comes up here and is going to the collector of this NPN transistor it passes through the NPN transistor and through this small 33 ohm resistor and back to the minus side of the battery so there's your little circuit now, in order for it to be a constant current, we have to do something more than just have a battery in there because the battery can't maintain constant current by its own. So what happens here is this same point, after you've gone through all these switches, the plus side of this battery is fed back through a duplicate set of switches and put across this potentiometer. This is the ohms adjust potentiometer, and it returns to the minus side of the battery. So in addition to this circuit here that I already described, you also have a little secondary circuit going like this. And this is the ohms adjust pot and some point is picked by this potentiometer and applied to the base of this transistor. Therefore it acts like a fixed bias voltage. If you hold a transistor in this configuration with its base uh, to emitter voltage, in other words the voltage from here to here at a constant voltage and it would be because once you've adjusted this pot there is a fixed voltage from here to here and that is applied across the base and across the emitter or f be between the base and the emitter and therefore across the base and emitter. If you've got that constant voltage then the uh, transistor will adjust itself to make sure that the current flowing from the collector to the emitter is also constant and therefore the current in this loop must be constant and it can only be changed when you adjust the ohms adjust pot up or down and to whatever point you adjust it then it maintains the current at that level. The objective here is to get the meter to be at full deflection um, and you adjust the ohms adjust to get that. You're trying to get the uh, current in this loop such that it results in a voltage of 0.5 volts. Now how do we get that? Well it has to be measured. So this point here at the bottom of this resistor is already at circuit common. It's the same circuit common that all the voltage functions were common to, so it's the same here and you develop a voltage across this 10 ohm resistor and then that res that voltage is measured across it through all of these resistors which don't make any difference because uh, as high as they might be they add up to about uh, 11 or 10 mega ohms uh, they're being going they're going into this FET which has a much much higher impedance so it doesn't even notice that these resistors are there and it's really just thinking of this as being a piece of wire that's coming down and measuring the voltage here well you might ask how do we measure the external resistance doesn't it seem like we're measuring this resistance well indeed we are we're measuring this resistance and the voltage developed across it but look what else is happening here. We have this ohms range switch and let's say we're set to the times one. In other words there is no multiplier. Whatever we see on the meter is the resistance. So the side of this resistor here, the top side, 
goes through this switch and continues back here, goes through the ohms switch out to the probe, and once again the probe will be in the direct mode, not through this resistor. So it goes through here, and it goes to the resistor that's connected between these two points, between the probe and the alligator clip. And it continues through that resistor, comes back, comes to circuit common, which is the other side of this resistor. So essentially we've taken the resistor under test and put it in parallel with this resistor. Well we know that if you put two resistors in parallel, the effective resistance is less than the lowest resistor. So if you're measuring, um, say, uh, 10 ohms out here, that's like putting another 10 ohm resistor in parallel with this one, and we know that two 10 ohm resistors in parallel is 5 ohms. Since it's only 5 ohms, but we have a constant current going through here, it's going to drop half as much voltage, or half as much voltage is going to be developed across those two resistors as there would be if it was just the 10 ohm by itself. Therefore, we've got half as much voltage. If 0.5 volts gave us a full scale on the meter, we'd be getting 0.25 volts at this point by putting a 10 ohm resistor across. Therefore, we'd get a half scale meter deflection. Since we already know that the meter is going to get full deflection when you um, don't have any resistor connected out here, Therefore, we know there must be 0.5 volts up around here. We put that extra 10 ohm resistor across here that drops it to 0.25 volts. That should give us a meter reading in the middle of the scale. Uh, and the meter is scaled, at least on the ohms scale, to be 10 in the middle. Well, in order to get that voltage, to put it at that position, there must be a 10 ohm resistor. So the camera memory card just filled up as I was saying that, so I lost track of what I was saying. But I think I got to the point of saying that if you have no resistor connected, the voltage developed across this 10 ohm resistor is 0.5 volts, therefore the meter is at full deflection, which on the meter scale is the infinity position. However, if you put a 10 ohm resistor across it here, that knocks it down to 5 ohms, which develops 0.25 volts across it, which puts the meter in the middle of its deflection, and the ohm scale says that that's a 10. Well, that would match because we're uh, in the times one range, times one multiplier, and we've got a 10 ohm resistor connected externally. So that makes sense. Um, but everything else is nonlinear, so if you put say a 30 ohm resistor there, that you get something which is not a simple ratio of, of this resistor. And therefore it becomes a nonlinear scale, which is why on the scale of this meter things look pretty linear to the left, but the further to the right they get, the more compressed things are, and a tiny space uh, amounts to a lot of resistance difference. That is the drawback to doing things this way, but it does allow them to reuse the single resistor divider um, to get the ohms ranges, instead of having to have a completely different set of resistors. So what happens if we want to read higher resistances? Well, we still put everything across this 10 ohm resistor. You might put a 100k resistor out here, and that's going to be across this. And the voltage developed will be, again, the result of the parallel resistance equation, but it'll be less than 10 ohms. And you'll pick up a voltage that is appropriate uh, across here, but now it has to represent a much higher resistance. So how do we get that? Because it'll be a, a tiny resistance, but now we're tapping off of different points here. To keep things a little simpler, what if we put the ohm switch in the times 10 or the times 10 multiplier, which just moves the tap point up here. So now the external resistance is being connected 
through this 90 ohm resistor. So redrawing it, it's like this. Here's the constant current source that used to be just putting current through this 10 ohm resistor, but now it's putting it through there as well as a parallel connected 90 ohm resistor in series with whatever is out here on the uh, probe and back to here. So some of that constant current goes this way, some of it goes this way, and develops a voltage from uh, here to here. And that voltage is what gets passed through the rest of the resistors in the voltage divider, whatever that may be, a very high resistance, and then it continues on to the part of the meter that's looking for 0.5 volts as full scale. Well, it's obviously a nonlinear relationship here, but it works out that if you were to put a 100 ohm resistor here on the probe, and now that the meter is expecting to see 0.5 volts full scale, but 100 ohms in this position will result in a voltage drop here that puts the meter in the middle of the range, which again is 10, but now you're in the times 10 multiplier, so it's going to be treated as reading 100 ohms, which is what you've got connected. So I won't do all the math here for all the permutations, but you can see it's not the simplest thing, uh, but that explains why the meter is so nonlinear. And really, if Heathkit had just thrown a few more resistors into this design, instead of trying to reuse the resistors in here, they could have done something that would have had a much more reasonable and I think useful ohms functionality. But that's essentially what they're doing. And the higher of a range you select, the higher the voltage or the higher the resistance in this position becomes, so it keeps changing the voltage divider that's made out of this resistor and this resistor and the amount of current that flows through that voltage divider as compared to flowing through the original 10 ohms and you always end up with something up here that looks to the rest of the meter like whatever resistance you're measuring divided by the multiplier. So uh, a squirrely way of doing it, I've never seen it done this way on any other meter by anybody except Heathkit in this series of meters. But just to keep it simple, just say that this circuit converts uh, as it needs to and ends up with 0.5 volts as a full scale. Okay, how do we measure this thing then? We've got a voltage that's uh, 0.5 volts up here and it's being presented to this circuit over here. Well, first off, we have to disassociate this circuit from whatever resistances are out here. In other words, this has to be a very high impedance to not have it become part of the voltage divider that's over here, for example. We can't have this circuit look like any kind of a load or a resistance to everything that's over here being used for scaling. So this has to have an ultra-high impedance and as it turns out, an FET configured as a source follower just copies whatever voltage is at its gate and presents it at the, at the source. Uh, so we take that 0.5 volt full scale and we just pass it through here. But now this is low impedance and this is very high impedance. And that's the function of that FET. So it's making a copy of the voltage that's here, but doing it in such a way that its presence does not affect anything here. That's always the old Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? That uh, you don't want to, by measuring something, change the thing you're measuring. You want to do it unintrusively, and that's what the FET buys you. Now, a normal FET source follower just has a power supply up here. In this case, it's B+, plus, if the camera will focus on it, which is 6.8 volts. It's right 
off of the uh, Zener diode voltage regulator here, 6.8 volts. And normally you would just have a resistor from the source here to the bottom of your power supply, which is B minus, which is the same as this point down here. But in this instance, Heathkit has put in a uh, constant current sink instead of a resistor. And it's doing the same thing that this constant current source does. It's an NPN transistor with a constant base to emitter voltage maintained by this circuit, thereby assuring a constant current from collector to emitter. So here we've got a voltage divider between B plus and B minus. So these two resistors are in series and across the 6.8 volt power supply. Therefore, as long as that is constant, then the base here is being held constant. The voltage from the base to the emitter is constant. Therefore, there is a constant current going this way. And uh, the end result of that is a voltage gain. But again, um, it's not really important exactly what that voltage is for our discussion. It's just not exactly the same voltage, but it does track proportionally the input voltage. Now over here you've got a simple differential amplifier comprised of these two transistors, this one and this one. Their collectors are tied to B plus and their emitters are tied to B minus through equal value resistors. Now here's one of the big places where the IM25 differs from this IM16. The architecture is exactly the same and everything over here is the same and it's pretty much the same over there with some additions. But uh, with the IM25 they're trying to make this circuit work a little better by having a separate return path from this and this. They don't go directly to B minus. They go through uh, another constant current uh, sink very much like this configuration in order to get back to B minus and the base of the transistor that's doing that is thermally stabilized by two more transistors so that should make it less drifty and more stable. Well by leaving those out here and saving some complexity and cost they could offer a lower priced kit but it's less stable as a result and it's driftier. Anyway, without that constant current source here, things are driftier, like I said. But ultimately, it's still a differential amplifier. Uh, the base of this transistor is driven off the source of this FET, so it's off to the, a copy of the input voltage and a lower impedance fed into here, and that controls how much this transistor turns on and off. A higher voltage here makes this turn on more, and more current goes this way. At the same time there's another identical transistor and its base is being held at a certain voltage 4.7 volts uh, by being tied between B plus and B minus. And therefore this is always being turned on a certain amount from its base but it has to share current with this other guy so if this guy's conducting more, this guy will conduct less. And if this guy conducts less, this guy will conduct more. Therefore, the voltage dropped across these resistors is different. If you have exactly the same amount of conduction on these two transistors, if they're balanced, in other words, then the voltage drop from here to here will be the same as the voltage drop from here to here. Therefore, if you were to measure the voltage from here to here, there would be no voltage because they're the same voltage. Measuring between two points of the same voltage is resulting in a voltage reading of nothing. Therefore, the meter is placed in between there, and it sees, well, there's no voltage from here to here, therefore, nothing. What does that tell us? That tells us that in order for the meter to read nothing, there must also be 4.5 volts or 4.7 volts 
on this transistor's base just as this one is always being held to. So that tells us that uh, for a meter reading of zero there has to be 4.7 volts produced by this FET at this point. And that isn't just because of this. There's another nuance. And that nuance comes in by the zero adjust. Once again, we have a voltage divider between B plus and B minus. It's comprised of these three resistors. I already described sort of how they worked. Essentially, it's just a voltage divider potentiometer between B plus and B minus, whose end points can be adjusted up and down by the bias adjust. When you have this adjusted properly, you end up with a point that's halfway between B plus and B minus. And what's the halfway point between B plus and B minus? Or, yeah, B plus and B minus. Well, it should be half of 6.8, right? So it would be 3.4. So 3.4 volt is the half. Waypoint between those two. So we're holding the circuit common of the front end of the meter at an elevated potential as far as this part of the circuit is concerned of 3.4 volts. So when I have 0.5 volts developed here for a full scale reading, that's 0.5 volts more than uh, 3.4 volts. Suffice it to say that that, that I just described, plus the functionality of this, in this stage, results in 4.7 volts being at this base when you want to have a reading of zero on the meter. In order to get a higher value or a higher reading than zero on the meter, this voltage here must be higher thereby turning this transistor on more, which mirrors in this guy turning on less. Therefore, now there's more voltage dropped here, less voltage dropped here, and now the meter can measure a higher voltage from here to here, and therefore you get an upscale reading. And at the end of the day, all of that functionality takes the 0.5 volts full scale from here, and ends up giving you whatever you need to get a full scale uh, on there. Now, there's more. Why do we need this differential amplifier, by the way? Well, it's partially because the way this guy works. Uh, we can't just go from this point to ground. It wouldn't work. Uh, so you need to do it differentially. But you also need to have a power gain which the FET here isn't going to be able to do by itself. In order to actually swing the meter movement around, you need to have what is effectively an amplification stage. This is a differential amplifier, after all. And the, the main thing it's amplifying in our case is the ability to drive a large meter movement. That's just the, the simplified version of it, but I think it'll explain it in a nutshell. Um, so beyond that, the meter movement has a particular resistance it needs to have in series with it because it's a 100 microamp movement. So 100 microamps will make it have a full scale reading. You need to make sure that when the voltage from here to here is such that you should have a full scale reading that you have enough resistance between here and here to cause 100 microamps to flow through the meter. Well, the meter itself has some internal resistance, so you have to add that to the external resistance to get the resistance that will cause 100 microamps to flow for a certain voltage differential. Well, to that end, there's the AC-Cal potentiometer and the DC-Cal potentiometer. 
There's also the ohms, but it doesn't have a potentiometer. It doesn't need one due to the way things are scaled. Uh, but essentially, once you've got a full scale value coming out of AC, you adjust this trim pot until the right amount of current flows through here to get a full scale reading. And also when you're in one of the DC ranges, you adjust this one similarly with a known input value to get the desired reading and therefore you know that it's all proportional from that point on. In the Ohm's case, um, it's just bypassing the the trim pots. It's just going straight to this resistor and measuring from here to here. You can think of this circuit here as sort of a virtual bipolar amplifier circuit. As if it were a plus and minus power supply, you can say, well, B plus is positive relative to ground and B minus is negative relative to ground. And that's sort of what's happening here, except that what are we calling ground? B minus isn't ground. It B minus has to be below ground for this to work if we're looking at it that way. And that is what this arrangement down here gets us. B minus is at the bottom of this voltage divider. B plus is at the top. And we're picking a point in between them and tying that to circuit ground. Therefore, circuit ground is more or less halfway between B plus and B minus, which makes B plus and B minus act like a bipolar power supply. And therefore, the voltages in here, even though if you're just measuring from B minus, the voltages are always positive, but if you're measuring from circuit ground, common or circuit ground over here, then they look like plus and minus voltages from that perspective. And that allows this differential amplifier to work. And because it's a differential amplifier here and we're using it in this way, that's why we have to have the zero control down here. Most meters that don't use this kind of circuitry have no need for this, but because Heathkit decided to design this circuit this way, they need this. Now, that's not terribly useful on this meter. It doesn't really buy you any functionality. On the IM25, the big brother of the IM16, there are some neat things that that one does that actually take advantage of the fact that this is working like a bipolar circuit. But the IM16 doesn't do that. It's just using the same architecture as the IM25 and doing less with it.